Well, hello everyone. Welcome another, to another webinar series on the complete wellness. My name is Francisca Osage, your host and physician. And as always, it is delightful. It is a delightful pleasure to have you all here. Um, shout out to my team, Anomal Health, and um, our collaborating team, the Moffields Eye Hospital. Thank you so much. So today we're going to be discussing on eye, eye health. We're going to be focusing on the symptoms of um, eye flashes and floaters. And for this discussion, we're going to be having a very distinguished guest, and I'm talking about Dr. Fahad Kehel. Now, Dr. Fahad Kehel is a consultant ophthalmologist specialized in retina and ocular inflammatory diseases at the Moffields Eye Hospital, Dubai, Dubai Healthcare City. He also specializes in the um, care and management of uveitis and other complex um, inflammatory eye diseases, as well as medical retina diseases such as diabetes, macular degeneration, inherited retinal disease, and retinal, um, retinal vascular disease. And he obtained um, ophthalmology in the UK at Oxford, Birmingham, and London, and also has acquired and completed three medical um, retinal fellowships in Birmingham, um, Birmingham, Oxford, and um, Moffields Eye Hospital. So he is responsible for um, well over 27 um, research papers in ocular and retinal diseases, and he is a member of the Royal College of Ophthalmologists. So, Dr. Fahad Kuhel, thank you so much for honoring this invite and welcome. <laughs> uh, lovely to see you, and again, thank you for the very kind uh, invitation. And like thank you say, you. Um, I, I, I'm basically a, a consultant, worked in the UK, born and brought up in the UK, worked there most of my life, but it's been great to uh, make this move to the United Arab Emirates and work with Moorfields uh, Eye Hospital here in Dubai. And like you say, um, my kind of my specialist interest is in 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 any general eye problem. Um, no eye problem is big, too big or too small. But yes, my specialist interest is in uh, medical retinal disease and of course um, ocular inflammation. That keeps me uh, busy, busy, busy enough. And again, thank you for the kind invitation to tonight's uh, webinar. Thank you so much, as always. Okay, so back to our discussion on um, eye health. You see, um, in our discussion, we're gonna be, like I said, um, focusing on the symptoms of eye flashes and floaters. So it appears to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, most times there's certain symptoms, eye symptoms that trigger patients or people. And then there's that prompt call to call on their primary care physician or the eye specialist. There are some on the other hand that people might, you know, just overlook and like, okay, well, I can always see my um, doctor anytime. And I feel the eye floaters and flashes might fall in that category. So I'm hoping today we actually um, shed light on the importance of these symptoms and the related conditions they are um, affiliated with. But before that, let's clarify um, something. So the concept of that eye specialist and who to see um, there are times I've met people and I ask them, okay, you have a problem? And they're like, okay, yeah, I, I met an eye specialist. Or who exactly? Uh, I think a, a, an optometrist. Or uh. So there's a confusion in those terms, the optician, the optometrist, the ophthalmologist. Can you please clarify who these um, eye specialists are and what exactly is the role? So the role of an ophthalmologist, an optometrist, an optician, what, and who now is responsible for this? Can we, can we clarify that? Once and for all. Honestly, Francisca, you hit it on the head. It was uh, definitely something that used to annoy me in my early days as an eye doctor. <clears throat> it annoys me less now, but you're right. The general public think an optometrist is the same as an ophthalmologist, and they're not. Mm. An optometrist is a very bright, capable, professional individual who's done a degree in optometry who is specialized in the refraction and testing of eyesight, of examining an eye, identifying potential problems, but referring you to an ophthalmologist who is an eye doctor. An ophthalmologist is somebody who specializes in the medical and surgical management of eye problems, so we don't tend to refract for glasses. We tend, we do sometimes, but we tend not to prescribe glasses. 
And our main role is in the diagnosis and the medical and surgical management of a phallic disease. We need ophthalmologists, we need optometrists. Of course, yeah. we need more optometrists because we need them in the community to identify problems, but actually they're the first step in the ladder where they identify the problem, but then it's very important that they then refer you appropriately to an ophthalmologist for a formal diagnosis, for a more advanced, more experienced assessment. Uh, and their training is different. Uh, the optometrist is a three-year degree, and then they will be working in the high street, seeing patients independently. An ophthalmologist would have be, done five years of medical school, done two years as a general medical doctor, and then 10 to 11 to 12 years postgraduate medical training before they're allowed to work independently as a consultant. And they just have a, that there is, it's not apples and pears, they are completely different and their experience and expertise is different. Both have valuable roles, but we also shouldn't confuse them. Thank you so much. And I'll add to that too. Um, so, so in addition to the optometrist referring a, a patient, a potential patient to the ophthalmologist, there could also be a referral from the primary care physician. So for instance, um, when we're doing um, the annual um, diabetic screening, uh, well, not annual, over here is every three months, but there ne needs to be that diabetic um, eye check. And that's, we the, the um, primary care physician refers such patients to their um, ophthalm ophthalmologist for that screening, you know, to yes. just make sure everything is in order. And right. also the ophthalmologist is the first person that will actually can, um, because of that training, and the, the training might depend on where exactly, because back in my home country, optometrists actually could be like six, five, six years. So it depends, you know, yes. but the ophthalmologist has gone through that whole medical school training. So they're very much equipped with knowledge. Um, every other person that has finished medical school has, and they're able to identify, even at times before the specialist, the medical specialist or surgical specialist, they're actually able to identify an eye problem that could be manifesting, you know, systemic problem that could manifest with ocular problems. And then they address it, but then also give that referral to that specialist that, hey. I mean, I mean that's, my, that's my experience all the time. I mean, exactly. um, a lot of the time, I, uh, in my because I'm a medical retina specialist and an ocular inflammation specialist, I'm often, um, the patient's presenting me with an eye problem and it's often me who's identified their systemic problem and then exactly. referring to the appropriate specialist to get the correct treatment. Yes, thank you so much. So uh, like another thing, another the, one of the, um, the, the importance of this forum is also to break it down, <laughs> if I could use the word. You know, we try to make some terms um, simplistic. So by systemic audience, we're really talking about um, disease conditions affecting our body, you know, the body systems. We have various systems in our body, the digestive, the um, cardiovascular, whatever. So when problems start um, um, occurring systematically, it might be um, a problem with uh, the heart, i.e. endocarditis. You might start having issues with, uh, that could be seen in the retina during examination. And the retina part of the eye is not something as obvious outwardly but when they do that um, ophthalmoscopic examination, they're able to see beyond the surface of the eye. So, okay, so back to the question. The next question I'll ask Dr. Fahad. Um, so we're emphasizing now on the symptom of floaters and flashes. So we know who an ophthalmologist is and an optometrist is. So the question I was gonna ask is, who's the most appropriate specialty to see? So obviously it's gonna be the ophthalmologist, right? Correct, correct, okay. the, the ophthalmologist. I mean, okay. I mean, um, in the UK, any patient who presented with flashes and bloaters to an optometrist, oh. even though they did a quick assessment, they would always, always refer to hospital for a formal oh. evaluation by an ophthalmologist. They would okay. not take the responsibility. And it's because, you know, uh, that eye doctor, he or she has had just thousands of hours of experience and seeing these problems day in day out yeah. yeah thank you so much for noting that okay so now the main question what is an eye floater or what then the next oh, the b part <laughs> i have a i have a presentation francesca oh okay so okay I, so if i share my screen yeah we got it we got it thank you <laughs> lovely thank you 
So, uh, flashes and floaters. Uh, when flashes and floaters occur together, they're virtually pathomonic for a condition called posterior vitreous detachment, where the jelly behind the lens at the back of the eye has separated forwards. And because it's separated from the retina, it induces flashes of light. But because you could now see the back of the jelly um, in front of the retina, so this is the optic disc, this is the Weiss ring, and now that jelly is moving in the eye, causing a floater. So the differential diagnosis for a flash or a floater is posterior vitreous detachment, migraine, and it's important when, you know, so the idea today is that we're gonna talk about the differential diagnosis, what a PVD is, what migraine is, what the other causes of flashes and floaters are, what to take in a history of flashes and floaters and when to refer. So floaters, again, are cobwebs or fl um, objects floating within your vision. And often it is a floater within the vitreous. And flashes of light are exactly that, where within your field of vision, you can see positive, bright, either white or bright colored flashes of light within your field of vision. So what are the causes for flashes? We've already mentioned one, which is posterior vitreous detachment, where the jelly has separated from the back of the eye. And as it's pulling on the retina, the retina makes a flash of light. It can be caused by certain cancers, a condition called CMV retinitis, which is an infection, a viral infection. Sometimes it's caused by certain medications. Uh, so, you know, drug toxicity of the retina. Sometimes it can be due to inflammation of the optic nerve, but also it is often you get flashing lights preceding the headache of a migraine. And floaters can be caused by either what we call vitreous sideresis. So the vitreous hasn't detached yet, but it's become liquefied and therefore parts of the jelly are floating within the uh, vitreous cavity, causing floaters that are visible in that patient's field of vision. You can have posterior vitreous detachment, again, like where the jelly is separated from the back of the eye. You can get floaters because of a bleed within the vitreous called vitreous hemorrhage. There's also a benign change that happens in elderly patients called asteroid hylosis, where they can get calcification of parts of the vitreous that often is asymptomatic, but in some patients can lead to floaters. If you have a posterior uveitis, so you have an inflammation at the back of the eye, either due to infection or due to autoimmunity, it can cause um, floaters. And like I said, there are certain infections in the retina that can also lead to floaters. So there's a wide differential of flashes wide differentials of floaters, but honestly, if you get flashes and floaters together, it is likely that this patient has a posterior vitreous detachment. So hopefully by the end of today, you'll know how to diagnose confidently a posterior vitreous detachment, a migraine without headache, and have a high index of suspicion if it's not a PVD, or a migraine, if there are unusual features of the flashes or floaters, or they have other symptoms. So let's dive in a bit more on posterior vitreous detachment. Let's talk about the anatomy of the vitreous, the mechanism for a vitreous detachment, something about epidemiology, symptoms, signs, and complications. And hopefully by the end of this few slides, you'll realize why it's important that you see an ophthalmologist but more specifically, or even better, a retina specialist, particularly if you suffer a posterior vitreous detachment. The anatomy of the vitreous, where well, it's mainly water, it's made up of collagen filaments and hyaluronic acid. It is strongly attached to the vitreous base here, but also strongly attached 
um, at the um, optic disc. And the attachments to the retina decrease with age. So as you get older, these strong adhesions around the disc to the vitreous base weaken, allowing the vitreous to degenerate. Obviously, as you get older, you can get depolymerization of this hyaluronic acid. This can release water, give you pockets of liquefied vitreous, giving fibrils within the jelly, which are visible as small floaters. So the jelly hasn't detached yet, but it's become sceneritic. So the patient now is aware of floaters within their vision, but they tend not to get flashing lights. Or the, the attachments to the nerve become weaker and then the jelly comes forward, giving you a large floater called a Weiss ring at the back of the jelly. And so then when the patient moves their eye, this is moving within the, within the eye, causing a floater to cast a shadow on the retina, which is visible as a floater within their field of vision. <clears throat> what are the predisposing factors to PBD? Age is one. So as you get older, you're more likely to develop a PBD. And what I often say to patients is that most of us in our lifetime will suffer a posterior vitreous attachment. If you're short-sighted, because your eye is longer, the jelly is a little bit weaker, is more predisposed to a vitreous attachment. If you've undergone cataract surgery, because there's a disturbance in the shape of the eye whilst you're having this surgery, that can lead to a separation or a vitreous detachment after surgery. If you have trauma, so somebody's punched your eye or a stone object has gone in the eye, because of the shift in the shape of the eye, it can forcefully separate to the jelly, causing a vitreous detachment or if you have inflammation at the back of the eye, over time that can weaken the vision, sorry, weaken the vitreous, causing a vitreous degeneration. So like I say, over the age of 70, about 60% of us will develop a vitreous detachment with you know, only 10% between the ages of 50 and 60 and 20% between the ages of 60 and 70. But most of us in our lifetime will develop a vitreous detachment. And if a PVD is present in one eye, there's a 73% chance that it will develop in the fellow eye if the patient is greater than 60 years of age. So what are the symptoms of PVD? In most patients, it's completely asymptomatic. So they have a separation of the jelly at the back of the eye and they are oblivious to any problem. In some patients, the separation of the jelly can cause flashes alone. In others, it doesn't cause any flashes, but it causes a floater. And in others, it can be flashes and floaters. And occasionally they can get symptoms from a complication of vitreous detachment so about one in 20 of patients, the separation of the jelly or the adhesion between the vitreous and the retina is so strong that as the vitreous separates, it tears the retina, leading to a vitreous hemorrhage and worse, a tear in the retina that if not treated early can lead to retinal detachment with consequent loss of vision. So why do you get flashing lights from a vitreous detachment? Well, it, because the retina only knows how to do one thing and that's flashes of light. It tends to be peripheral arcs of light, like a lightning streak. It occurs in eye movement. It's best seen in dim lighting and it's very brief but recurrent and usually precedes the onset of floaters and may persist for months to years. Floaters from a PVD, so this is the back of the jelly. So as you can see, you've got a white ring there that's in front of the optic disc. And as the, and now that it's separated, as the jelly is moving, the floater is moving, causing a moving uh, object within your field of vision. 
it's much more prominent than small floaters and vitreous cinereses. And it's due to the Weiss ring or prominent high load membrane. And it may be described as a curtain, shadow or blurring of vision, but the patient can see through the curtain or around the shadow. What are the complications of PVD? Fortunately, it doesn't happen in most patients, but in 5%, one in 20, it can lead to a vitreous hemorrhage because as the um, jelly is separated, it's pulled on a blood vessel, or the jelly is separated so forcefully, it has caused a tear in the retina. And eventually, if this tear is not identified quickly and treated, fluid can seep behind the retina, causing a detachment of the retina. So basically, the retina comes back from the uh, from the wall of the eye, like wallpaper, and if not treated again with surgery, can lead to blindness and permanent loss of vision. Really, we want to avoid this complication. We want to pick the patient up at this time, which is why it's important that if you develop a PVD, that you have a full assessment by an ophthalmologist to identify that one in 20 chance of having a complication and for it to be treated and preventing harm and irreversible vision loss. Wow. So again, wow. so what are the symptoms? That, sorry, go on. Yeah, exactly. So what are the symptoms of vitreous hemorrhage? It's different to a floaters. They like little spots like raindrops or a sandstorm. And it's because you're, in, you're seeing individual red blood cells or black streaks, which are streaks of blood. Or that vitreous hemorrhage could be so extensive that because of a large vitreous hemorrhage, they actually, the vision is completely blurred. And when there's vitreous hemorrhage, we as ophthalmologists are very nervous because there's an increased risk that a retinal tear or retinal detachment would be present in that context because the jelly is separated so violently from the back of the eye that it's caused the bleed. And what are the symptoms of a retinal tear? Well, there was no symptoms from the tear itself. As you know, the patient cannot tell the difference between a flash and floater of an uncomplicated between the flashes and floaters of a complicated PVD. It's important that if you're aware of flashes and floaters, that it is assessed by an ophthalmologist. If a retinal tear isn't treated, there's a fifth percent risk, it will progress to a retinal attachment. And if caught early, we could treat it with laser, prevent a detachment, because once you develop a detachment, even if we can save the vision, you're needing major surgery to correct that. What is a retinal detachment? Well, it's because you've developed a retinal tear. This is a histological appearance of the tear within the retina. And this is a schematic where you've got a tear in the retina and that allows fluid to come in from within the jelly, behind the retina. And because the retina is not stuck onto the eye with, you know, permanently, it allows the retina to come off, causing a detachment of the retina and a blurriness in your field of vision and you get a loss of visual function within the area of retinal detachment. Oh, one of the symptoms of retinal detachment when it can give you a shadow, it can be progressive. And this is a good picture showing a retinal detachment. Can you see how the shadow is affecting the field of vision and there's distortion of the buildings in that area? Thankfully, the center of vision is still not affected in this patient, but if you don't repair it quickly, they're going to go blind and you need to do major surgery to repair this. You can't repair it with laser or a minor operation. It's a, a big operation to repair this. And you want to, if the patient saw the eye doctor quickly, we might pick up the tear without a detachment and treat them early and keep them from harm's way. So what is the a prognosis or a natural history of a symptomatic posterior vitreous detachment, where the risk of developing a tear is about 8%, and the risk of developing a detachment is 3 to 7% in a symptomatic PVD. So that's quite high odds. And if a detachment develops, it usually occurs within the first six weeks. So what is a migraine? Sometimes you can get a migraine aura without a headache. 
It can occur in any age, but it's more common with increasing age. And in most patients, the first occurrence is over the year of 50 years. And remember, 45% of migraines with aura suffer reporting the just visual changes without headache at times. And often it's because, why do you get a migraine? Because you have a wave of depolarization, so electrical activity across the occipital lobe, which is the part of the brain, at the back of your brain, that sees. And because you get a propagation or a wave of electrical activity it, within your occipital lobe, which is the part of the brain that sees, you then see this aura within your field of vision that starts small, small, but as the wave propagates, it gets bigger and bigger. And that's how you know it's a migraine. Wow, thank you so much. Um, okay, forms of migraine. So really because of the time um, constraint we have, we really might wanna really focus, be more um, specific. And this is a very beautiful, beautiful um, presentation. And there's just so much, you know, to download. <laughs> I'll, I'll very quickly just take, go through no, the history. No problem, no problem. Thank you, just a reminder. So when you're taking a history of flash of light, okay. What are the flashes of light like? Is it an arc of light? Because PVD doesn't give you colored or jagged lights. Where in the vision are they? In vitreous detachment, it tends to be peripheral. How long does it last for? Again, in a posterior vitreous detachment, it tends to be intermittent, like lightning flashes. And when does it, how does it develop? Oh, I move my eye, that's when I tend to see it, or I tend to see it in the dark. Is the vision affected? No, the vision is affected. That's in keeping with vitreous detachment. If the vision becomes affected or it's colored and it starts small, gets bigger, it's likely to be a migraine uh, without aura or with, with a headache. When do the flashes occur? If it's an eye movement and at night, it's more likely to be a vitreous detachment. And also ask about timing. And then what floaters, ask about how the floaters, what the floaters are like, size, number, is it see-through? Do you move with the eye movement? Are there any flashes of light? Is the vision affected? Timing, when did it start? And any features like retinal detachment, so is there a permanent shadow in your field of vision? If there is, get them to see an eye doctor urgently. Is there any short-sightedness? Any previous eye surgery? And why do we need to refer a PVD? And I would argue you need to refer all patients with PVD to exclude a retinal tear a retinal detachment and a ret because if you can identify a retinal tear with when, when it hasn't detached, you can treat it urgently with laser and prevent the retinal detachment developing. And if you, God forbid, should develop a retinal detachment, you want to identify it early enough before the macula is evolved to ensure the best visual outcome. And surgery is very rarely considered for floaters and only ever in exceptional cases and in patients with persistent symptoms who are significantly perturbed by vitreous floaters. And when to refer PVD if they have symptoms of vitreous hemorrhage, symptoms of retinal detachment, like a shadow, if it's within the last six weeks, if they're very myopic, history of detachment in the fellow eye. But honestly, I think you're better off referring all of these patients to have a formal assessment by an eye doctor to improve the safety and the optimum um, assessment of these patients. And what do we do with the PVD when we see them? We tend to dilate them, so it's nice to warm the patient that they may have drops put in their eye. To dilate the pupil, that may blur their vision, but it allows for a much more enhanced and um, uh, um, improved quality of assessment of the fundus. So we can confirm the diagnosis, exclude a tear, exclude a detachment. And we, I tend to follow them very, always, very closely in my clinic. So I tend to see them every few weeks for the first six to eight weeks. Then after eight weeks, I see them every month for the first couple of months. And then I see them up to about four to six months. And if there's no problem, I tend to discharge. And then I advise them to come back if they've developed any new symptoms like an increase in floaters or shadows. And like I say, 
we very rarely operate on these patients because of the, the fact that it's annoying, but so long as they've not developed a tear or a detachment, these floaters don't cause any harm in the vision, they're just annoying. And invariably, most of the time, the vitreous will continue to separate and eventually that floater will disappear out of that patient's field of vision. So in summary, flashes of floaters together, often is due to vitreous detachment. Flashes alone, maybe due to migraine aura without headache. There's a small risk of retinal tear and detachment with a PBD. As for symptoms or history, which may increase the risk of retinal tear, retinal detachment, i.e. previous surgery, myopia, and the risk of detachment is considerably reduced if the symptoms are greater than six weeks, but there's no harm in that patient be, being assessed if they come to you with this complaint. Thank you very much indeed. Wow, wow. Dr. Faha, thank you so much. That was a very, very big, big lecture, interesting, and so much of information there to unpack on um, um, floaters and flashes. So we do, we um, get the importance, the significance, especially when it comes to the retinal detachment now. That is when we're really like bothered as an this is a case of emergency. We don't want it to progress to a case where we have a retinal detachment. Well, basically it starts off with the posterior vitreous detachment, right? And if yeah. you remember in the anatomy of the eye for our audience now, those that are very um, aware of basic um, science or you know, biology, when we have that eye, the, the retina is the part of the eye, the back of the eye that actually um, receives visual signals you know, that is where the, the vision is imputed before it gets to the brain for interpretation, you know. So I guess when the, the, the posterior uh, vitreous is detached, it's almost like the image now is being um, focused on the retina. The, 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 yeah, those so, are the, so, seen as the floaters and the flashes, right? So normally the jelly comes, from, the lens is here and the, the vitreous is all the way attached to the so, retina. Okay. And what happens, and it's attached very firmly, but then what happens with age, those attachments become weaker. And so it lifts up, but as it lifts up, it pulls on the retina very slightly. And the retina is made of light sensitive cells. So it gives a flash of light. Okay. And when okay. you move the eye, the jelly is moving and it's pulling on the retina, causing a flash of light. Okay. But then as it's separated, and you're moving the eye, what is happening is as it's, as it's moving, it's casting a shadow on the retina, which then appears to the patient as a cobweb or as a circle in their vision, where they okay. can see through it, but it's yeah. very mobile. Okay, so thank you so much for that explanation. We have, uh, we have so many questions right now, and, um, and we are, we, um, so our audience, please feel free. I'll, we'll try as much as possible to address all these questions. So I'm gonna go straight to the questions, Dr. Fahad. Um, the first question I see here, I'll read. I had a surgery to correct a retinal detachment on my right eye and had a laser treatment on the left one. Is there a way to clear eye floaters? How do you monitor eye floater to ensure that you are not at risk to retinal detachment? So that's the first question. The second question I'll address, but let's see if we can um, address that first of all. So Dr. Fahad? So there are treatments for floaters. Mm. I don't offer them because of the, the risk benefit profile, in my opinion, is unfavorable. So there are two treatments. One is a laser treatment where they use a YAG laser to clear the floaters, mm -hmm. but there's a risk of retinal injury, potentially with blindness. Mm -hmm. And so I've taken a mild problem and given the patient a more serious problem. Mm -hmm. And in the end, I took a Hippocratic oath oh. to first do no harm. Yeah. If I'm going to offer a treatment, it has to be in the patient's benefit but also I have to be confident that it's safe and won't do any harm. Yeah, yeah. So I don't offer it because I don't think it's in the base of bed injury. There is a, another operation which occasionally 
can be recommended if a patient is significantly affected. So it's so difficult that they're unable to do their job, for example. Oh. Or it really, um, say, I don't know, they're a shooter or a, um, a jeweler, and it's the, it's the eye that they're, they're doing everything in. You can do an operation where you do the same operation you would do for his attachment, mm -hmm. where you make three tiny holes in the white of the eye and you suck out and cut out the jelly from the back of the eye. Okay. But again, that's not without risk. It in, it in turn, can induce renal tears, that operation, cause potentially a detachment. But even if, uh, and although the risks are very low, it is the benef risk benefit profile. Yeah. Also, when you do that operation, the, even if the operation is done very carefully and successfully, it can, uh, and the, the natural lens in your eye can become cataractus and become cloudy over two, three years later. So now you've given a minor problem of floater. Yes, it's upsetting and disturbing, but there's a very high success rate, sorry, high chance that it will disappear from your vision with time. Only a few patients are that unlucky <coughs> where it persists. But then you've given a minor vision disturbance and potentially induce a detachment, which can have impact on the quality of vision. But also, you've gone and given a patient, a patient another operation, because then they end up having a cataract operation yeah. a few years later. So it's, 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 you know, I don't know if in, in, in Nigeria I have the saying, but in England it's sm a, a smashing a, a, a <laughs> walnut with a sledgehammer. Yeah. You have a tiny problem and you're, you're using a big solution. Mm -hmm. I know it's a long answer, but I hope it gives your the person yeah. who asked the question Definitely. some understanding for why we don't think it's a good idea. Yeah, so we still have to, um, you know, there, there is a the, the 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 element of risk assessment when really vetting. Okay, do I proceed with this, um, you know, procedure or just counseling the patient on like, okay, you might have to like, you know, let's just have this weightful. Um, management for now and see. Okay, now because there are many other questions, I'll go to the next. You no, know, I'm sorry to sorry to interject, but you know, there's the other saying, and these things are so good. You know, mm. you know, better better the devil you know, better <laughs> the devil you know. Sometimes the minor problem that you have is better than a major problem that you could have unintended because you you know. So sometimes it's it's always a risk benefit with mm. any medical intervention. Definitely. Okay. So the next question, and I'll read. Um, I had a surgery to correct a retinal detachment on my right eye and had a laser treatment on the left one. The right one has gone from bad to worse since after the surgery, always feeling sore, visual vision decreasing. Later on, it was detected that I have developed a stage four macular hole, retinal cyst, and retraction. The left better eye that underwent laser treatment now developed woolly Wooly floaters, please, what can I do? What kind of help will be beneficial to me? Well done and cheers. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yes. so, so just unpack, unpack it for me. There's a lot in that question. So she had okay. cataract surgery. Uh, no, she, she actually had a retinal detachment on the right. On the right and side. Had a, and had a laser treatment on the left. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, so sometimes they do laser treatments if they see areas of weakness in the left eye. Okay. So they do, so if they had a detachment in one eye and you see an area of weakness, like thinning or whatever, then they do laser as a protection. So okay. then, and then she developed blurred vision in the left eye. Yes, the vision, um, vision decreasing. Now she, she, did, she did mention the right eye, the right eye has gone from bad to worse since after the surgery. Um, she said the vision is decreasing. And then was told, later detected, she had a stage four macular hole, retinal cyst and retraction. So the left eye, repeating the question, the left eye better now, um, left better eye uh, that underwent laser treatment now developed woolly floaters. So she now has 
woolly clothes. So the question I'm going to ask though, when you're having mm -hmm. eye problem, can you really tell which eye is really presenting with the floaters? Because it's a common vision, right? Yeah, you can. You can if the if, if the page if the patient's smart enough. So if they close yeah. one eye, yeah, yeah, that's then they'll true. know. If they don't, then yes, they can't tell. If you close one eye, you can tell. Okay. I think she needs to see an eye doctor. Um, it may be nothing serious. It may just be a posterior vitreous detachment, but it may be that's what she's having. She's being aware. She's aware of her vitreous detachment. Uh, I bet I'm. I'm. Pro it's probably that this uh, um, the caller has uh, myopia, possibly. Hmm. Yeah. So, like said, better still because you know there, there are symptoms we we do have. Well, really, until you have that um, examination, you know, objective examination, then you can actually tell. You know, at times presenting with certain symptoms, yeah, it could lead to um, point to something, but you can't really make that objective assessment on what the problem is until you really examine. And maybe at times you might need to do some other investigation, right? And then they can say, so the, 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 the bottom line, you still need to see the ophthalmologist, you know, to um, really um, um, verify what the problem is. Okay, now are there other questions? If not, I'm gonna go back defaulting to my own questions. And I did have, um, I did put up some questions to ask and most of it has, has actually been addressed. Let's see. Oh, there's still one more. Uh, why does it seem as if floaters move from one eye to the other eye? Well, somehow we've addressed that, right? Yeah, just just because um, um, unfortunately, if you develop a vitreous detachment in one eye, you have a high likelihood that it's going to happen in the other eye. Or if your floaters are due to vitreous degeneration or sinaresis, so the jelly hasn't detached, but it's breaking down internally, it's likely that it's going to happen in both eyes. Okay. Okay, um, so this has been addressed somehow. The question I had there was um, certain groups of people. So we know, do, do know that um, as we age, we become more predisposed to this condition. Well, are there other, um, a certain group, maybe the nature of the eye, the anatomy now that might predispose a certain group of people to this kind of condition than other groups? Perhaps, is, there, is that possible? A scenario yeah, like that? Yeah, possibly, um, that, that, yes, there, there is a group. So patients who are short-sighted or myopic, because they tend to have a longer eye, and there must be, and there's something about their jelly that's inherently weaker, so they're more predisposed, predisposed to developing a vitreous detachment. Okay, okay. Um, so still talking about eye health now, um, and generally we have. Um, during the course of the presentation, we did see certain um, uh, risk factors associated with um, these conditions that, that ultimately will lead to the posterior vitreous detachment. And remember, you mentioned um, infection too, like cytometallovirus infection can predispose, you know, and migraine being uh, a presentation of flashes. Now, is there any role for um, prevention? So maybe diet, dietary prevention, or, so, you know, um, how really can we? protect our eyes, you know, um, sort of preserving the, the life, um, should I say the lifespan now of the eye, that integrity of the eye, what, what, what would you suggest really? I think there are three things that we should all do. Not take up smoking. Oh. As best as we can try and wear sunglasses or UV protection in outdoors. And thirdly, to have a balanced diet with lots of fruits and vegetables, green leafy vegetables, mm. <clears throat> fish, uh, as well as um, eggs, um, because that will give you the vitamins and the lutein and the omega-3 and the fish oils that will all benefit um, your eyes. So if you're like me and you like all those foods, it's perfect. You just have more of them. If you don't like those kind of foods, then you can consider buying supplements. So there are specific supplements that are there in the market that are uh, that have all the constituents that you need for good eye health. Mm. So generally maintaining eye health, and yeah, there's that importance of of um, the sunglasses, 
you know, protecting us from the UV. And generally, other than um, conditions of cataracts too, uh, those are, you know, wearing sunglasses does preserve the integrity of the eye. Yeah, and also the, the diet, you know, um, emphasis on certain kinds of um, diets. And there's, yeah. and there's what, one more thing, mm. uh, making sure that even if your eyes are healthy and you don't need glasses, that you get your eyes checked every couple okay. of years. So that can be either by an ophthalmologist or by an optometrist. And this is where the optometrist really is helpful because there's more of them. So they're able to <clears throat> screen the healthy asymptomatic patient. Mm. But if they find a problem, then they need to refer you to your specialist. Okay. So that um, regular um, check of the eye. And typically when you go, when we visit the primary um, care, our primary care, there's that, um, you know, check assessment of the um, eye um, and if any issue is found there's a referral so it's still emphasizing the need for the um, check you know annual visits to the doctor at least an annual visit to your primary care physician and then they can actually um, while um, examining the eye they can you know see if there's any issue arising and if um, a referral can um, be made Okay, so are there more questions? Um, we've answered the question on um, plotters. Um, and I, I will um, uh, encourage our audience if um, there are more questions to ask regarding eye. And this doesn't necessarily have to um, be, this is an eye specialist now. <laughs> You're in the consulting room with your ophthalmologist, you know. So if there are any other questions, questions. Um, it doesn't have to be on floaters or flashes. Um, are there issues? Everyone okay with their eye? Any question? We, are, we're, we have a time to entertain more questions um, regarding um, eye symptoms. Okay. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Fahad. Um, there's so much to, so much to, the, the, the work to unload here on the topic. Um, and um, in the absence of other questions, um, hmm. okay. So we will remind our audience for, um, we're gonna be having, um, our next topic is on sudden, um, card, um, sudden death, sudden death, especially in the adult population, sudden death. We're gonna um, be um, having a, a guest speaker, a cardiologist talk about the hearts and more. And of course, some um, other issues that could have caused um, sudden death. So today's topic, um, eye flashes, floaters, we had um, we had Dr. Fahad again, a consultant ophthalmologist, a guru in eye treatments. Too kind, too kind. <laughs> yes. So, um, and um, we don't really have much questions, um, but there was so much to unload. There's really, um, the, 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 there were a plethora of causes of um, eye um, floaters and flashes. And um, we did mention in case of emergency, where, when do we know this is a case of emergency? We're actually worried about it progressing to a retinal detachment and fear. And once you start to notice that shadow in your visual field, that shadow, you, you're seeing, you're looking straight up, but you're, there tends to be casted in front of your vision, a shadow, and you know it's not in the external environment. That is a clue that this might just be a case of emergency and you want, you want to um, refer as soon as possible to be referred to an ophthalmologist because if that is not done, you can actually, we, someone can actually lose their vision. And once that is done, it becomes quite um, difficult. You know, there are some cases it's irreversible, right? Okay. And so unnecessary well, if, because you, by, uh, by presenting earlier, Mm. you could have avoided any loss that, of function. Occupation, definitely. Someone asked this question, is there any type of eye makeup that is bad? It's, it's so true. <laughs> you know, I, I actually, this is a very good question because at times I, I use a lot of mascara <laughs> yes. and, and, you know, stuff around my eye. And at times, at nights, there's just that like, oh, gosh, I just want to sleep. I'll wake up to wash it up and all that stuff, you know. And before you know it, it's morning time. Oh, I have slept with my makeup so what are the how are you yeah. okay, we don't have to worry you know yeah all i would say um i've never seen in my career any real harm from makeup mm. um, 
and there's a male doctor who likes his, who wants, um, who wants to make his female patients comfortable. I have never been so strict with my patients about makeup. <laughs> I think it's unfair. And as men, we, we, we never understand what it is to be a woman. So I, I, I've never, ever been strict. You know, patients will, my female patients will say, do I need to stop wearing makeup? I said, look, I'm never going to stop you wearing makeup. But what I would say, there are principles. Your eye is the most important organ of your body. Most, one of the most important organs of your body. Buy quality makeup. Hmm. Buy something from a reputable trader where you know there is a, it's safe and has been manufactured by a reputable brand hmm. where you know it shouldn't cause any harm to your eye. Hmm. Um, secondly, if you are unlucky, and because of your makeup, it is causing itching, redness of your eye, speak to an eye doctor, because sometimes it might be that you need to think about hypoallergenic. And what I've often sometimes said to my patients, you know what, I'll treat the allergy, you carry on wearing makeup, because I don't, I feel very bad that I will um, deprive them of that, uh, <laughs> that luxury. <laughs> but I do think it's important that, yeah, just as you know, you would be, you'd want to make sure you bought a car from a reputable maker. Make, you know, because this is, you're applying something to your eye by reputable product. It doesn't have to be expensive, but yeah. from a reputable brand. Noted, very noted. Thank you so much. There's another question here. Driving at night is sometimes a problem. And of course, but I actually experienced that personally. I actually have to, I have my glasses here. Yes, anti -ref reflection. <laughs> oh, <laughs> because, really good. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Because the, the, the uh, you know, oncoming lights, they just blind me. And like, I, I actually avoid, if I don't have to, I don't drive at night. So the question here is any cause for that? Driving at night, can you address that? So first thing to say, uh, what I often say to my patients is, all of us find it uh, difficult to drive at night. No, 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 there's nobody who, who can tolerate headlights <laughs> coming into their eyes. Mm -hmm. So in the end, you do have to use a visor. There are night glasses that you can wear if it's problematic. Mm. Um, but for most of us, so long as we are using a visor or we're kind of just moving our head just side to side, we're okay. Okay. But if you're exquisitely affected by it, so much so that it's absolutely blinding you, then there's probably either some scarring at the front of your eye, in the front window of the eye, the cornea, or your, it's a sign of developing early cataract. Cataract. We okay. do know early cataract can be a cause for glare at night. And so it's important then you see an eye doctor because it might be that you need surgery in order to resolve the problem. But often with patients, I often say, you know, try something called night vision glasses, which seem to just dampen the yeah. brightness of that headlight, making it easier to drive. But honestly, we all have difficulty driving at night and we all get glare with headlights. So it might be that you're just normal, but if you want get yourself checked out, no harm. Yeah. 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 And right now, you know, there's so much of technology um, involved in all aspects of medicine. So that glare, you actually have um, I mean, so much of, um, what should I use the word properties can be infused in glasses now, reading glasses that, you have the anti-glare, you have the, you know, just really to address and give you as much perfect vision as possible. So, yes. So in that case, we're going to see an optometrist. Yes. Not necessarily an ophthalmologist. Not necessarily an, an ophthalmologist. With, but, yeah. they, but then they will refer you if they identify a condition that needs medical or surgical treatment. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. 
Oh, and the last specialty, um, the, the last, who is not necessarily involved in eye um, um, treatments, but I also mentioned the opticians. So I'm assuming the opticians are the ones that actually um, make the lenses, right? Yes. They, they, they uh, formulate the lens, you know, so that's another distinction. So optician might not necessarily address eye disease, right? But has to do with the formulation of the. Oh yes. Yeah. So what they will do, their main remit is to uh, identify refractive error. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so you know, a blurring of the vision that can be corrected with glasses, um, contact lens fitting, um, examining the eye if you are symptomatic to identify mm. problems that might need the attention of an ophthalmologist, um, and obviously fit you for your spectacles. Okay. But they, uh, through no fault of their own, they've not had that experience. Um, the only way an optomet optometrist can take added responsibilities in the UK is that they have to work under the supervision of an ophthalmologist. Ophthalmologist. So, it, so at the end of the day, it's the ophthalmologist who is the doctor who has both the medical and the optical experience, but is trained in the medical and surgical management. And it takes years, it takes okay. years to get that level of experience. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much, Dr. Fahad. And thank you, my wonderful audience for joining yes. us in this um, webinar. And our next webinar is gonna be on the 24th of November. Like I said, the topic is gonna be on um, sudden death. Um, and that's a very interesting topic. Um, We'll give you more information regarding our speakers. So, um, unfortunately, I think we've um, we, we, we have gotten to our time limit. So, I'm gonna be we'll have to end this um, webinar session. But thank you so much um, to the Mockfields um, Hospital Eye Hospital for collaborating with us for this um, session. Thank you so much, Mockfields, for giving us Dr. Fahad. <laughs> Thank you so much for honoring this invite. And my beautiful audience, thank you. I'm going to see you. Either I or Dr. Chichi will see you in two weeks. So two weeks, 24th? Yeah, two weeks. So enjoy this. From here, it's good afternoon. Over there in um, the UK, it's good evening. And is it good night, <laughs> Dr. Fahad? Good night. It's good night okay. in Dubai. Good, good, good night afternoon. in Dubai. Good evening. Good night. Okay, you guys, see you in two weeks. See you next time. Take care. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.